Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is. I'm Peter Whittle. Now I'm delighted to say that my guest today is one of our most requested. Douglas Murray, the best-selling author and columnist, uh, was first on the show last year. He came on to talk about his latest book, which is The Madness of Crowds, Gender, Race and Identity. Before that, he'd written another international bestseller called The Strange Death of Europe. Now, The Madness of Crowds is out in an updated paperback. It's just come out this week, so I'm delighted that he's come to talk about it again. Thank you very much, Douglas. It's a huge um, pleasure to be back. Nice yes, to see you again, Peter. Your timing is, is, is pretty spot on, isn't it? Uh, yes, I mean, in some ways, I'd say regrettably. Yeah. Um, I had thought slightly at the beginning of this year, particularly with COVID, I thought, well, maybe all this identity politics stuff would go away. Uh, the paperback was coming out. I was reflecting on what I would say in this updated edition. And then I just, uh, there was no shortage of material. There mm -hmm. was no shortage of things to say, to write about, to reflect on. Um, Yes, it's it's it feels to me now as if I tried to sound an early warning yes. siren, yeah. and you know sometimes people have said to me, "Well, it seems it's very prophetic," and there's this problem with being regarded as being in any way prophetic, which is that you immediately people think it's flattering, yeah. but actually it's not because a really good prophet would have stopped something happening. You know, You're being hard on yourself. Well, <laughs> sure. I mean, I'm overstating what you can achieve yeah. with a book mainly. But, you know, yeah. if you actually say to people, you've got this catastrophe coming yeah. down the road, yeah. stop it now. And they run harder and faster yeah. and nastier. Then you do think slightly, you know, could, could we have warned people better? Mm. Um, yeah, of course. Mm. One thing that interests me is with, with the book, Obviously, we're talking about the uh, incredible emergence of wokeness, identity politics, the way they're dominating. That was the theme of the yeah. book, and why are they dominating? But you presumably had a lot of people contacting you afterwards, mm. um, because we hear the big cancellation stories, don't we? Yeah. But did people get in touch with you and say, you know, this is the situation I'm in? And yes. Yes, I had a lot of that, uh, emails, letters, and when we could still do public events, uh, um, you know, the most moving one is people in person mm. coming up to you after events and telling their stories. I, one of the ones I found most moving in a way was the number of people, it didn't happen a lot, but it happened a fair amount, parents of children who'd been going through the trans thing, mm. just, bewildered, bereft parents just saying thank you for helping me try to see what's happening in this because people in that position have been totally ignored. Mm. I mean, no, when every professional says either your child is in the wrong body or you'll have a dead child, mm. accept it. And when people are being threatened with the suicide of their children yeah, by yeah. medical professionals, yeah, yeah and no one cares mm. you know that 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 really struck me mm. um but yes uh, you know i i got some of that the other one i suppose i heard most rather inevitably you won't be surprised to hear this is people in you know good what we would have thought of as good reliable jobs mm. who just can't say anything mm. Mm. and and of course for anyone in the position I'm in, and I think you're in, where thank goodness we can say mm. what we mm. think, and we can say what we feel, mm. and what we notice mm. with our eyes, um, that 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 adds, gives you an added responsibility. Mm. I think you said this that actually you do have a duty. I think I think yeah. I, I don't I don't want to misquote you. If you don't have an employer or you don't, mm. you've almost got a duty to make some sort of stand. I think that. I mean, it doesn't have to be. A, I'm not saying that people should take a political stand or argue a particular set of mm, policies. Yeah. I just think if you are in a position to say what you see and to argue out your position, and in a way it matters less what that is than that you can do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, if somebody was in a position where there was some terrible injustice 
of any kind mm. and they felt they couldn't identify it, we'd know that something was systemically wrong. Mm. And yet we have this situation where on issue after issue and job after job, people feel they not only don't have the right to speak, but yeah. don't speak. Yeah. Yeah. And of course that means that those of us who are not in hoc to, you know, or vulnerable to an employer, of course that means that we have a, a certain extra duty, I think. Yeah. But my hope is always that everybody can do it. Mm. With the trans, the trans issue that you mentioned there, I think there were uh, quite a few people, commentators, who thought that this was the tipping point, that the absurdity of much mm. of it, and in fact the, the damage of so much of it, would somehow make people pull back. But I don't get the feeling that's happened. Aren't you suspicious of tipping points in general? <laughs> I mean, by now, yeah, aren't yeah, you? I mean, yeah, how, yeah. how many years on how many subjects <laughs> Have we heard people say, I think this might be the tipping point? <laughs> I think it's wishful thinking. You know, I, I remember it always used to happen with the terrorism thing. Because I think this one will be the tipping point. <laughs> yes. And then things did things happened which you would have thought wouldn't be just be a tipping point. Yeah. It would be a complete tipping over point. And everything went on as normal. I think, so, I think you might have commented on that with the Manchester bombing. Yes. You thought, yes. this surely, your daughters yeah, yeah, are yeah. being killed. Yeah. Well, you, you saw just the other day, uh, um, Harry Cole uh, was on Sky News with a lunatic of the left. I, I don't know who she is. She's a new lunatic to me. And uh, she was talking about the sentencing, said, you know, I think well, we need to find out why the sentencing was so, uh, you know, long. And obviously, I mean, she, well, she had no plans That's to right, read the yeah. judgment, did yeah. she? No, I mean, yeah. <laughs> she spends her evenings yeah. poring over judicial, you know. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and she said, well, I need, we need to see why the, uh, the sentence was so, so particularly long. And Harry Cole said, maybe because he killed 22 young people at a pop concert, you yeah. know. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But uh, I was delighted he made the point because yeah. so many other people seem to have forgotten it. But yes, I mean, this, this, mm. so the whole tipping point thing on issue after issue, I, mm. I, 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 wish, I wish that we had tipping points. Perhaps we can see them in the rear view mirror. Mm. But when you're going through them, I think it's very hard to see what the tipping point is, not least because it might be something which is, is relatively small scale. I mean, maybe the tipping point on the trans one is, I said in the Madness of Crowd, as in the first edition, I said there are legal cases that are going to start, and when that really gets going, this will stop. And now some of that has started. Right. You know, a young person in the UK has got um, legal aid funding to take action against the Tavistock Clinic. Yeah. I do think a bit of that will will speed us up to realising we were going in a very dangerous direction there. Also, do you think that the J.K. Rowling thing has helped at all? I mean, it's related, obviously. Yes. She wasn't cancelled for what she said, which was uh, basically a woman, you know, people who menstruate, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, you she, mean yeah, a woman. Yeah, you mean yeah, a woman. You mean a woman, yeah. And um, she wasn't cancelled. There was another, of course, around the same time, another company did, that said, you know, people with vaginas... That's right. Yeah. Is that, and, <laughs> and, you know, J.K. Rowling and others are right to say yeah, we didn't yeah. used to be known as people with vaginas or yeah. people who menstruate. There's a word for it, women. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the, the J.K. Rowling one was interesting because it, it's worth reflecting when somebody doesn't get, as it were, successfully cancelled. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is it because she's very rich? Well... That's possible. Powerful. Yeah. powerful. You know, money does bring yeah, certain yeah, power. Yeah. Um, she she's probably quite hard to complete the real thing with cancel culture is people going for your source of income so that you are yeah. totally bereft and effectively made homeless yeah, yeah, and that's what yeah. they want yeah. so it's hard to turf jk rowling out of every one of her houses by now i imagine but 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 that, i don't want to diminish what she did it's an exceptionally important thing that people like her particularly women mm. like her particularly women of the left mm make their voices heard and uh, this again argue the truth as they see it mm. uh, and yes I, I, this has a huge impact and also let's face it i mean you know i'm sure there are some people it's easier to portray as bigots and some people it's hard it's quite hard to say mm. that harry potter woman is you know basically goebbels i, I mean they try <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> obviously but it's yeah. it's a tough one yes well she was actually always very 
sort of woke. I mean, oh, she was yeah. all, all very much on that team. Oh, yeah. Going, Kevin people. Myers, yes, yes. the distinguished Irish writer, yeah. uh, wrote at uh, The Spectator the other week, reminding people that J.K. Rowling, when the, when the Twitter mob came for him several years ago, she, uh, she led it. Yes. She whipped her yes. people up. Yes. So, you know, but anyhow, hopefully people who've done that mm. then realise that was a horrible thing to have done and it's come for them. And so you know, try to step back from that kind of behaviour. You mentioned people coming up to you afterwards and getting in touch with you with their personal experiences. I remember when you came on the show last time, Douglas, you, and in the book, uh, you're talking about how we go forward. And mm. one, one of the ways to go forward is to try not to live so politically. Yeah. To, to be loving, I think. Yeah. Actually, I, yeah, I yeah. found it really quite a moving conclusion. That would you say has become more difficult now? I mean, or, mm. or how do people do it now? Because a lot of people mm. I feel now, and I, I've certainly the reaction that I get from uh, people who write into the show and everything, is of utter despair, mm. despair, you know. Mm. They feel their context is being essentially taken away from them. Yes, yes. So what do they do? Um, I do think, this issue of trying to depoliticize our lives is more urgent than ever. Mm. Um, what I tried to suggest at that, in that passage in the Madness of Crowds was to say, young people in particular have been misled. Mm. They've been misled into thinking that purpose and meaning in life can primarily or best be found in political activism. And there's lots of reasons why I suggest that isn't the case, just one of which is you'll never win, mm, mm, you know. Mm, mm. You'll never win totally. Mm. You'll win the odd round. Um, but as you know, po politics, political activity is a constant tug of war mm. uh, in which you very rarely, in fact, never win outright. Mm, mm. Um, so it's, 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 it's dangerous from that point of view. It's dangerous also because you will imbue it with too much meaning, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, if you think that everything in life is about politics, then the people who disagree with you are unmentionables, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they, are, they will be people who are deliberately trying not to do that which is good. And you'll find it very hard to find you'll find it very hard in the end to live in the same country as them even. Mm. Uh, and, and so that, that's, that's one of the reasons. But the other is, is just that central fact that, I mean, so many writers have touched on this over the years. I always think of that uh, figure in, it's in, is it in Bleak House or Hard Times, Mrs. Jellaby? Mm. who Dickens shows, you know, she's, she spends all of her time raising funds for a far off land in Africa that she's never been to. And she has all of these children of her own who she completely ignores. <laughs> in fact, when we first meet yeah, the Jellabies, yeah. the youngest Jellaby has his head stuck in the railings. And Mrs. Jellaby doesn't have time to remove her no. son's head from the railings uh, uh, because she's got to save this... And we all know this type. It's why Dickens, yeah. in his great genius, was able to create the character because yeah. we recognize the type. There's a lot of that today. Uh, there's a lot of suggestion that that's what we should do. I mean, look at the whole Greta Thunberg, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. children's crusade, as we might call it. Yeah. What is that but an urge to involve yourself in a very great task? I think it's uh, P.J. PG, PG, O'Rourke said, yes. what is it? Every, he says, uh, P.J. Rourke said, everyone, everyone wants to save, save the, the world. world but no, no one wants to help mum do the dishes. Exactly. Yeah, no yeah, one wants yeah. to help mum do the dishes. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, uh, we also now have this thing, which we should identify, which is not just the uh, wanting to save the world, but the cult that is now operating. Mm. When people are told that they should disassociate from family members who do not agree with them, you're not dealing with politics, you're dealing with a cult. Mm. Something that tells you to give up a portion of your worldly goods, um, remove yourself from the environment of your family and loved ones if they are not sufficiently of the correct view mm -hmm. 
this is a cult. Uh, anyone who's ever lost a relative or met somebody who's lost a relative to a cult knows this is a cult-like behavior. And this is what's happening. Mm. And so that's one of the other dangers of this imbuing, of, of this attempt to find meaning in politics, is that you will also go into that utmost place yeah. where you're not even involved in politics anymore. You're involved in cults. Mm. You said a very interesting point there about how it's hard to live with people who are going to consider you sort of wicked, if you like, mm. um, or even the same country. Yeah. And that is not far-fetched, actually. No. I mean, uh, you, you sort of, sometimes, you, you know, I said, don't we all do this? And we, we look and say, well, wait a minute, you know, is this the dominant attitude now? I mean, this came up during Brexit, of course, with people mm. who, who voted Brexit. You know, they, they were essentially bad people. Mm. They, were, they were stupid, wicked people. That's a very dangerous situation. Do you think that's alleviated, by the way? Um, no, I think it's just transferred. Right. I think you see it with COVID, actually. Yeah. Whatever your view on COVID yeah, is, yeah, I think yeah. you see it's this kind of strange moral righteousness, you know. Yes. That is what I am. And it, yes. as you were saying about sort of like um, cults, there is this sort of sense of I'm, you know, I'm going to purify myself. Yes. This is me purified. Yes. You know, I'm totally pure now. I, I is woke. Is yes, woke? yes. Uh, and of course, really, I mean, one way to change this is to identify this behavior and identify what it really means. Mm. Um, historically, what does it mean when somebody wishes to go around parading themselves as a person of virtue? Mm -hmm. Almost certain it means they're guilty of every vice you can think of, and then some you haven't <laughs> thought of yet. <laughs> it's a very reliable yeah. rule, isn't uh, it? Oh, it is. um, people who go around, you know, lecturing people over sexual morality, as my late friend Christopher mm. Hitchens used to say, make a small note mm. in a book. Mm. Make a jotting, and before long, you'll find them, you know, spread eagled on the floor of a public lavatory. And yeah, with an orange in their mouth. Yeah, and um, <laughs> maxing out the credit card paying for a transsexual. And yes. that's, that, that's, that's pretty reliable, that rule. Yeah. And it's happened once again in recent days in America with a certain um, man of the cloth. Um, really? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so we know that type. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we've known it for so long. You know, Chaucer wrote about this mm. type. Mm. The, for some reason, we haven't identified them in the current age. Yeah. But, I mean, we have, we have whole classes of these people who, uh, I mean, the, the most obvious is the ones who jet around the world in private jets telling us not to fly on cheap budget holidays. Yeah, yes. um, these people are Chaucerian figures. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, the, the climate, the most extreme climate activists, and clearly now the most extreme woke activists. Mm. They are all this hypocritical new priestly class. And I don't mind other than the fact that people are unwilling to identify them as such. Yeah. If they came along with, you know, dog collars and purple robes, we'd identify them straight away. But because they're sort of, you know, dressed undercover, we don't. But we should. We should call them out. I mentioned at uh, the very top there about the updating of your book. It's an afterword. Uh, and it is extraordinary, actually, the period since your book came out first. Mm. And, you know, I think in some ways, probably, Douglas, you could have written an afterword to the afterword, actually, because yep. it's sort of events are going on and on. Are you surprised, first of all, are you surprised at the extraordinary intensity of the cultural onslaught that there's been from Black Lives Matter onwards? Mm. And I also want to really ask you, do you think that it's actually to do with Black Lives Matter? Or in fact, are we seeing the extraordinary weakness of all of our institutions? Because they are the ones mm. that have capitulated, whether it's the Archbishop of Canterbury, mm. right through to the Premier League, right through yeah, to yeah. all of them. But I, I, I mean, what is your, when this happened straight after lockdown, really, were you taken aback, you know, with the statues being, um, I was struck by how far they went so fast. Yes. yes. I mean, we're, we're sitting in London talking about this, and of course, we've had, you know, butter cold compared to what's been going on in America. Mm. Um, there was a very worrying moment in this country, wasn't there, where uh, when the statue of Colston was 
torn down in Bristol. And I particularly objected to that. I, I was on a radio show with a, um, um, a maniac from The Guardian, and uh, this, this man said, well, were you in favour of the pulling, were you against the pulling down of the statue? Of course, Colson, you know, Douglas, I said, yes, of course I was. He said, oh, so you're in favour of slavery, are you? Yeah, and I said yeah, to him, you know, yeah. how much easier do you want to make this debate mm. for your side? Than that? You mm. think that's what it is, mm. you know? Mm. You think that those of us who mind seeing mobs pulling down things in cities are desiring to bring back slavery. I mean, you need to lie down after mm. you speak to somebody that dim, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and there he was seriously arguing this. And of course, really what it was that struck me and worried me, as I'm sure it did you, was we know, those of us who know and care about history, we know what this means because we've seen it before. Now, we saw a glimmer in this country but anyone who has read the history of the French Revolution, you don't even need to have read Burke's reflections on the French Revolution. We know how this goes. Anyone who's read about any revolution knows this is how it goes. And in this country, thank goodness, eventually the police reasserted their authority. Eventually, our conservative government managed to defend our history just about just about in america the police have stepped back considerably for reasons which are very obvious and city after city in america is burning and now in america you cannot unite around the history mm. because of a project that has been underway, I think, for two generations that has taught people a lie about their history. And we should get on to this because this is, uh, this is a really... Well, you can talk about it now. I mean, yeah, this is a really dangerous this, moment. Oh, it, it is. And again, it's the sheer speed of things. But when you talk about this project that's been going on for two, uh, two de decades, did you say? Two generations. Two generations. Um, there is also, um, initiated by the New York Times, an actual project, mm -hmm. which is called the 1619 Project. Yes. Is it? Which is an attack on the American Revolution. The 1619 Project aims to change the founding date of America and turn it to the time that slaves were first brought into the... Mm -hmm. the well, it wasn't even the Republic yet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so pleased you raised that one because it is the epitome of the problem. Uh, the teaching of young Americans that their country is not just a country that is not particularly virtuous, but that their country is the worst. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, and I say this with all due respect to my American friends, unfortunately this is only possible because of mass ignorance in America. Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out that the ignorance is not from the people that we might have assumed would be ignorant people. It is from the elites. Mm -hmm. It is from people whose parents remortgaged their houses to send their children to college to learn this stuff. And we have this in Britain. Mm. We have this in Britain. Uh, we have the idea that we are the country that has been bad in history. Mm. And the problem is, is that when you push back against this, there's a tendency of people to say, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? Because you're British. And you can say in response, yes, that's true. I, I do defend mm. the things in my country that are good. But I also believe that on any fair analysis, this is also possible. And this, this fair analysis is now something that is not happening in either America or Britain, and we have to address it. Um, I wrote recently on this whole issue, take any country in the world, it's thought that over the period of around the 17th century, up to one and a half European, no, one and a half million Europeans were seized by the Barbary pirates. One of the reasons why by the people in Britain sang and sing, Rule Britannia, and Britons never shall be slaves, was because of the familiarity in the public mind from Defoe and others who make it clear, the familiarity with the concept that you could be enslaved. And that wasn't enslaved by the Americans. It wasn't enslaved by the 
horrible other British, it was enslaved by the Barbary pirates, among others, mm. by the Moors, as they were called then. Now, if we're going to do this grand historical sweep, that regard history as this vast savannah which the grievance mongers can hunt through and find things in, good, let's do it. Mm. I want to get Turkey first. Mm. Right. They've got it coming. They really do. The Ottoman Empire was one of the longest, <laughs> widest empires in human history. Yes. We have to make the Turks mm. pay. Mm. Half a million Anatolian Greeks chased out, massacred and chased out only a hundred years ago. We don't have to go back two and a half centuries as you do in Britain to our terrible, terrible past. We can go back far less time to Turkey. Mm. Where are they going to pay the reparations? Where can Greece send mm. the bill? Should it send it to Ankara? What about all the other people? What about the Armenians? The first great terrible genocide of the 20th century. Where can the remaining Armenians get their reparations from? We can do this on every country on earth. I'm completely up for it. If people want to decide that all of us who are Europeans and Britons, who are descendants of the people who feared being abducted at sea or on land by the Barbary pirates should go now to Algeria and take their money. Fine, let's have a go. Mm, mm. You think we'd get peace? Mm. You think we'd get justice? You think we'd lay any ghost to rest? We'd dig the whole damn thing up again and then some. Mm. And that's what they're doing to our country. And that's what they're doing to America. It's fundamentally unfair. It's fundamentally unjust. It's fundamentally dishonest. In some ways, what's been happening, what you're describing there, but what's been happening over the, past, over the summer in America and here to a lesser extent, but in America, I see really as being described in both of your books. See, not just the man's crowd, but I see you talk about with in the strange death of Europe. I should explain to people. Uh, you you talk about the massive collapse of confidence in yes, Europe. Yes. But when you wrote it, Doug, did you would you have thought that this would have applied to America too at that time? Uh, I thought I thought it was less advanced in America than it's turned out to be. It's moved much further, much faster in America. Mm. I thought that America had. Uh, the sense that we had in Britain and that we, we probably both still have that we had done things wrong in the past but that by and large we were a force for good in yeah, the world yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. yeah. and the Americans I've known throughout my life and I've always admired America I've always had my criticisms of it like everybody does of everywhere I mean show me a perfect country um, but I always thought that Americans had this sense that of course, you know, of course, the founding fathers had not been perfect, but my word, were they people, mm. you know. Mm. Um, yes, there had been slavery, but there had also been a very bloody civil war fought in a country that tore itself apart to stop the evil of slavery. Mm. I thought they still had the narrative of goodness about themselves. But they have been taught, uh, as I say, for a couple of generations, the narrative of nothing being more evil. And I suppose if you, if you tie that in with a country which, by its geographical location, apart from anything else, is a country where a lot of people don't go abroad all that much and see the rest of the world, um, you know, this is always used against Americans. It's not necessarily. A, I've never a, quite got No, that. it's not necessarily. A, you it's know, a beautiful country. It's a huge, huge country. country. It's, a, it's, a, it's a continent. Yeah. And, and, and um, but, but it, it, you know, as, as we all know, if you do go abroad and see a lot of different cultures, you do notice without needing to over, you know, think it, you do notice some of the things that are good in your own culture, which you're happy yeah, you've got, yeah, yeah. you know. I remember once um, coming out of North Korea with some friends getting across the Chinese border and a friend of mine is saying to me, welcome to the freedom of China. <laughs> <laughs> Frying pan fire. <laughs> one, it's one of the great dry lines I've ever heard. Um, but it did feel like that. We were like, oh, we can breathe out now. Um, uh, um, but so, so it is the case that if you travel around, you, you, you can see, and you see among other things, gosh, the things I've taken for granted, I, I shouldn't have done, 
you know. It, it, that, that's why traditionally people have been encouraged to, to travel, is, to, is among other things, to learn about the world, but also to get in a better perspective what's good about the place you're from, which otherwise you might take for granted. In this country, we have now, though, this same, this same perverse teaching as Americans have got, that, that we in Britain were not a force for good in the world. And I, I, I have a problem with this, not because of some sentimental thing or not some sentimental thing alone, but because it's such a clearly unfair analysis mm -hmm. of us. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, if, 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 if I can think of an occasion when that was epitomized recently, the one I minded most, I'm sure you probably felt the same, was after the Black Lives Matter protest, once again, once again, people from that protest graffitied the Cenotaph. Mm -hmm. And those young men and women from the Household Cavalry went, it turned out they're from the Household Cavalry, went on their morning off in their civvies and cleaned the graffiti off. And this one is young, you know, activists of Black Lives Matter with their friends videoed this and derided those young men and women for doing it. One of them said, uh, oh, you're so keen that you, to, to, you won't even leave the, you know, the Black Lives Matter on your precious monuments. On your monuments, yes. Your precious monuments. Yeah, yeah. And I thought several things from that. One was your. Mm. Wow, you're treading on a landmine there. Mm. These are either our monuments, our monuments, or they belong only to some people. And if they only belong to some people, we're going down the worst imaginable path. Mm. And it's those people that would lead us there. But the second thing <coughs> to say about that is, what this country needs to say is, yes, yes, they're precious monuments. Yes, they're precious. And we make no apology for that mm. because our forebears, yours, mine, gave their lives and are commemorated silently at that place. Mm. So no, you don't get to deride us. You don't get to laugh at it. You don't get to graffiti it. No, your cause is not more important than that. Mm. You can have your holy places. Fine. We have ours. Mm. Exactly. Uh, this is serious, but how serious? I mean, we talked about the speed of events. When particularly you look at America, as you said, uh, their holy places, are s seemingly endlessly systematically under attack to the point where it actually it was not inconceivable that they would go after Mount Rushmore. At one oh, point. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, in fact, the New York Times sort of egged it on, if I remember. CNN uh, said that the president was speaking in front of uh, statues of slave owners on land stolen from Native mm, Americans. Mm, mm. Uh, 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 un unbelievable, you would think, anyway. But what are we talking, I mean, are we talking about, are we actually talking about the decline, not just of countries, but actually the fall of a civilization? It could be. It could be. That's what I suggest in The Strange Death of Europe. And, you know, there's four centuries that it takes for the Roman Empire to properly collapse mm. from the time you can identify the start. Um, there are lots of very bad signs around. Um, and I have a suggestion of how this can be avoided. I have quite a lot of suggestions for how it can be avoided, but can I, can I make one suggestion to begin with, which is this. Why don't we try to work out who are the honest critics who wish us well and who are not, mm. you know? When people say you can be a better country if you do X, do they really want us to be a better country or do they want us to end? Mm. There's, I've, I've dwelt rather too much perhaps on mad people, but can I throw one more yeah. in? Um, there's an academic at Cambridge, I won't name, at a oh, certain yeah. college named after somebody far greater than she could imagine. Mm. 
um, who is a race baiter, a racist, I would say. Uh, she says the most disgusting thing about things about white people on a regular basis. And it's an amazing thing that an institution like Cambridge should still have such a person in their employ. However, I would say when she says things about modern Britain, she doesn't really wish us to become better. She wishes us not to be, mm. seems to me. I, I don't mm. wish to attribute mm. motives to people that aren't there, but that's how it appears to me. Um, and I think there are an awful lot of people who have an awful lot of voice and an awful lot of noise they make in the public square who are of that opinion. They think that this country of ours never had anything good going for it, that we don't have anything good about ourselves now, that we've just done the worst and most racist thing imaginable in deciding to be sovereign, and um, it would be better if we weren't here. Mm. Uh, I submit we do not listen to these people. Mm. Uh, they don't wish us well. They don't wish us well. And we know, we all learn in our lives who we should listen to. Mm. In our lives, we, we learn, should I listen to this person when they say this about me or not? And we have to, as we form our characters, work out who gives us good mm. advice because they want us mm. to be good mm. and who gives us bad advice because they want us to fail. Mm. Mm. We all encounter this in our lives, mm. but we also encounter it in, in civilizational yes. terms, in national terms. We have got an awful lot of people who pose as people wishing us well, wishing to simply improve us, who clearly wish us ill. And I think they're very hard, they're, they're, they're very easy, sorry, they're very easy to spot. Mm. They are the ones who misrepresent our past. Mm. They are the ones who say that we are things that we're not. They are the ones that pretend there's nothing good about us. And so when we, when we are made to pretend that those people are sincere mm. and good people and that we should listen to them, we hasten the decline that you fear rightly. We bring it on mm. because we invite our enemies into the sanctuary. Mm. And, uh, and that is, by the way, those people can be of any, any background. Mm. You know, Portland, Oregon, where, most, where the most extreme madness is now happening nightly on the streets, where uh, people in search of Nazis who call themselves Antifa, anti-fascists, uh, find there's not enough Nazis in Portland, Oregon, and so just bashing old women's heads, you know, they find in the street, haul people out of their cars and smash their heads until they've hospitalized them. You know, th these are these fine, mm. fine new anti-fascists. That city of Portland is something like 92% white. Mm. You know, most of the people... Uh, the, uh, the people who you see in the police mugshots when the police do bother to arrest anyone for uh, harming people in Portland, Oregon, most of those people are white. They have been, you know, so this isn't a racial point. These people are, these critics, these malevolent critics, the people who do not wish us well, can be of any background. I felt that rather about the people who pulled down the Coulson statue. Yes. You know, because they were mostly white. Yes. Mostly white. But also it was the the way in which they did this, this stamping on the statue, yes. which first of all felt alien to me, but, but also there was, this was not a reason, this was pure unadulterated hatred, yes. and I, I'm sure it wasn't just about statue. No, it, it, I, I agree with you, I thought it was a generation who among other things had, had learned odd bits mm -hmm. of recent history. I mean, I've, you know, the whole taking the knee thing, when Dominic Raab mentioned it as coming from Game of Thrones, everyone laughed at it. No, that's, that's one of the ways it's, it's come in, mm. definitely. Mm. Uh, and when before people in Britain saw Iraqis hitting the statue of Saddam mm. Hussein with their shoes, would we have seen people in Bristol jumping up and down on a statue and hitting it with their shoes you yes, know so yes. i mean we do live in this global culture where we learn mm. bad as well as good habits in very strange ways yeah. um but i agree i mean i thought the whole the whole site in bristol was a very alien alienating uh, uh, scene mm. um and you know where to even start with where those people have ended up i mean um no one's gonna no one is going to be able to 
reach the heights of the morality that these people expect. And there's a sadness in that because it means that their own lives will be very unhappy because they will intuit at some point that they themselves cannot live up to the standards they believe exist. Mm. You know, because one of the most important things about a real rounded understanding of history is the fact that everybody in history did things that we think are mad. And we will be doing them too. And we might realize that in our own lifetimes. Mm. And so part of the purpose of thinking is to think what we're doing that's bad now and stop doing it fast. Mm. But if you think that your job is to judge everyone in history as being lesser than you, I want an extraordinary mindset that is to yeah, have yeah. found yourself in. I mean, there's no one to live up to, is there? No, no, no. Other than yourself. This is, this is perhaps the great thing is that, is that it, leaves nobody, it leaves nobody to admire other than yourself. Which is a, it's sort of childlike, actually. It's oh, yes. Well, well, I mean, it's why the child leads the child's crusade. Yes, exactly. I, I mean, childlike. they found a person who they can revere. It is, it is all, it is all the, 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 the end of religion coming back in another way, isn't it? You know? Well, actually, that is what you say in the book as well. Yeah. This is the strong relig religious element. Yes. Religion's gone, and this is, the, this is the, the secular religion, if you like. Yeah, the way to yeah. show that you're yeah. good, yeah. the way you pay your tithes mm. to Black Lives Matter, mm. you, you wear the lapel mm. things that show you're in the right club, and so the mob will pass you by. Mm. You, know, you stick the right sign outside your shop front. You chant the right things. You put your blackout thing on Facebook on the right day. You tweet the right thing. You've got to tweet that day. When you're told you're not yeah. to tweet that day, you don't tweet that day. And that isn't really living, though, is it? I think one of the flashpoints in the situation might well come in November. I mean, to, to bring us mm. back down to, to, to sort of political day-to-day -day <laughs> politics with the election. Uh, you've got a you've got a big following in America, uh, Douglas. You've glad to say, hear it. That's sorry, right. nice to hear. Well, you have, haven't you? I suppose so. I mean, yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice uh, to hear. I like I like, well, I like having American readers. And, yes, and you've, you've yeah. been to the White House, haven't you, in the past? Oh, yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> light, light under a bushel. <laughs> 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 no, um, no. But what, yeah. what I was wondering is, will you, uh, you know, at this, will you? Go, do you think you'll go to the states during between now and mm. the election? Will you I'd do like to. Like yes, that? I'd like to. I'm very interested in it. I'm very worried about it, mm. um, and it's obviously a hugely important time. I mean, mm. Um, mm. you know, it's it's it, it matters among other things because I do think that you know, the thing that we have always worried about. Those of us who think about foreign policy issues have always worried about is what happens after the era of American hegemony. Mm, mm. And um, if this is, if America is breaking apart, if it is in the, if it is in the the territory of civil war where half the country thinks there's nothing good about the country it's founding or anything else, then we're in civil war territory. And if that's the case, then eventually we're talking about the end not just of the American era, but of the Anglo-American yes, era. Yes, and then we're yes. talking about the rise of the Chinese era. Mm, mm. And um, yeah, people will love that. Mm. They'll love that. I can't wait to see, well, I could, could wait, but I'd rather not see how the woke warriors get on when China introduces a security law like Hong Kong. Yes, I, apparently Extinction Rebellion are going to sort of have one of their demonstrations in Beijing. <laughs> oh gosh! If they have any need for funding to send them there, I will. I will chip in. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you again, of course. Um, and um, I should say again, Douglas's book, "The Madness of Crowd: Gender, Race, and Identity," is just out in paperback. So do get it. It's you know, if you want to understand what's happening more, it, it is a book to get. Uh, Thank you very much for coming on. It's Maybe come pleasure. back, will you, um, you know, after the election or something, in, if you go to the States or something, maybe if you can. I'd love to do that. Yeah. I'd love to do that. that, that um, I irrespective of what happens in November, none of this is going to be going away. No, no, no. no. Thank you very much, Douglas, once again. Thank you. And uh, the book is The Madness of Crowds by Douglas Murray. It's 
out in paperback now uh, and it explains an awful lot about what's going on at the moment. So see you next week on So What You're Saying Is. Thank you.